good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Implementation and Follow-Up of the IEP, and it will be presented by Ann Wilson. My name is Pam Christie, I'm the PTI Director here at PEAK, and I will be monitoring the chat throughout the training. Before we get started, um, I'd like to go over just a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You will all be muted for the presentation. And then please use the chat to ask questions throughout. Closed captioning will be added after the webinar and before we post to our website under archived webinars. Handouts were emailed to you on Wednesday. And as you leave today's webinar, if you could, um, you will receive an evaluation survey about the presentation. And we would appreciate if you would just take a minute to complete that and provide your feedback. And it's my pleasure to introduce Anne, who will take it from here. Thank you, Pam. And thank you all of you for joining our webinar today. Um, again, my name is Anne Wilson, and I work on the staff of Peak Parent Center with the Parent Training and Information Center, as well as on our alternative dispute resolution project with the Colorado Department of Education and on our programming related to youth in transition. Um, I do want to acknowledge today we're talking about IDEA, which is a complex legal framework and Peak Parent Center is a training and information center. We don't provide any legal advice or services. So you may have joined us for some of our prior webinars, but this is the third in a series of three parts. So two weeks ago we had preparing for the IEP, including um, some basics about the purpose of IDEA evaluation and eligibility. Uh, last week, we talked about the content of the IEP, and today we'll look at implementation and follow-up of, of the IEP. So before I get started, I wanna launch a poll and just get a feel for who's on the webinar today. So if you could take a minute to um, answer the questions. Let's see, anyone else? We're... Oh, it looks like we've got the full range of, we have some of parent, educator, service providers, and other, and also people from pre-K, elementary, middle, and high school. So we've got all the grade eight ranges, ages represented today. Um, okay, so um, again, the implementation of the IEP, Oh, hang on. Um, the implementation of the IEP is the actual delivery of the services and supports that are outlined in the IEP. Um, this slide gives you an overview of what we'll be talking about today. First, we'll, we'll talk about what the law says about implementation and what that means. We'll talk about the responsibilities of the schools and the parents. Um, we'll talk about uh, progress monitoring at a high level. Um, because that's a very detailed subject. And then we'll talk a little bit about managing conflict as well as the importance of advocacy and family engagement. And finally, we'll follow, finish with a few resources. Oops. Oh. Okay, so first what the law says, and this text on the slide is actually from the regulations that implement IDEA. So everything in the regulation is within the definitions of the law. So the first has to do with when IEPs need to be in effect. And that regulation says at the beginning of each school year, each public agency must have an effect for each child with a disability within its jurisdiction. An IEP is defined in section 300.320. And so um, when they say ch each child with a disability, that means each child with a disability as defined under IDEA who has been determined to be eligible for special education. Um, and so basically, if your child is eligible for an IEP, that IEP needs to be in effect on the first day of the school year. Um, this doesn't apply if your child hasn't been identified or determined eligible. And um, so if, you're, if something comes up during the year, then your IEP will not wait till the following school year. But um, if you have an existing IEP that you need to have a current IEP at the beginning of the year. Um, and then second, this is sort of the timing of delivery of services. Each public agency must ensure that as soon as possible following development of the IEP, special education and related services are made available to the child 
in accordance with the child's IEP. So what does this mean? More in plain language. So the IEP needs to be implemented as soon as possible. Um, that there can't be undue delay in providing services. Um, the responsibility is shared. It includes the general education teacher and the special education teacher. And that's really important to be aware of. I think it's easy to kind of think of special education as a separate thing. But um, if you remember for the, from the first webinar, special education really supports the general curriculum. And, and so this is everyone working together. And so if you have related and support service providers in your IEP, they are also responsible for implementation for what they are, for what is provided in the IEP. Um, all team members, including parents, are responsible for continually evaluating the effectiveness of the plan. Um, and then there was that timing piece that we mentioned in the regulation. It's expected that the IEP will be implemented as soon as possible following the IEP. So, you know, that's reasonably possible. Um, you, there may be things that take some time to get into place. Some reasons why you might have a delay could just be the timing. If you're having meetings over the summer, your services won't take place when school's not in session. Um, if you are, um, if, if there's something that needs to be worked out, such as transportation, or maybe you have assistive technology and that you need to get the equipment and have training. So those things should be happening, um, but, but there are reasons that might slow this a little bit. So the school district responsibility, um, the school district is responsible for collaboration and communication among the whole team, the, the parents, the teachers, and the student, and not just teachers, the um, service providers as well. Um, the district is responsible to see that services are provided as planned and documented on the IEP. So that's really making sure that the IEP is carrying, carried out, meaning that you're getting the services for the time that's provided in the IEP. Those services should be reflecting the IEP goals. And you may remember from the first webinar, we talked about a free appropriate public education and the standard and how an IEP must be reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of their circumstances. So that's kind of an overarching principle of, of what should be in the IEP and how it should be carried out. The school district is also responsible for students' progress on his or her goals. And we'll talk a little bit more about progress monitoring. Um, a couple points, well, actually this, this, this point is about high school, but outside agencies which are to provide transition services are monitored. That doesn't mean that the school district's kind of overseeing them in, in that way. It's um, if you have outside agencies that are part of your transition IP, the, um, th those need to be happening. And if they aren't happening, the IEP team may need to meet and discuss alternative ways to meet that. Um, but even though they're outside agencies, that doesn't mean that they don't have to deliver what's provided in the IEP. And then finally, periodic reviews take place as scheduled at least once every year. And we talked about that in the first webinar, you have your annual review, and then you'll have your triennial reevaluation. And then there may be other reviews for specific reasons. And the important parent and student role. Um, the parents also have a role to communicate with the school about your child's progress, just as the school is responsible for communicating with you. You're both seeing different things. And so it's important to have that communication going between you. Um, sometimes I hear about the school will say, oh, everything's going great, your child's so happy. And then the parent will say, oh, my child falls apart when there's, when things, when, you, when they get home. And so, you know, there's some, there might be something going on there that you need to work out and you have, you're both are seeing very different things. And so that's just one example of why that two-way communication is important. The student also has a responsibility to communicate whether the IEP is providing him or her with a meaningful learning experience. And that, that may be difficult to communicate in that way. I don't know how many students will actually say my IEP, IEP is providing me with a meaningful learning experience. So you wanna think about how does your student communicate? And I think we mentioned in our first 
webinar that behavior is communication too. And so really trying to almost be a scientist and understand what's going on and, and really be um, a, a, a careful listener to what your child's trying to tell you. And, and the more that the child can be involved with input in their IEP as they go along, the easier it gets to prepare for transition when you get to that age. Again, remember that as a parent, you can ask for an IEP review if you feel your child's not making adequate process, progress. Okay, so next we will talk about progress monitoring. And as I mentioned, this is really a big topic beyond the scope of this webinar. A couple of the handouts, I think both the handouts you received deal with progress monitoring, so that can give you more information. But just know that progress monitoring is the ongoing process of collecting data to determine student progress. Um, we often think about data as quantitative and sort of collecting numbers, but data collection can happen in a variety of ways, including qualitative data, including observations, looking at their classroom work, having conversations. So um, there are a lot of ways to progress monitor and a lot of information on that. If, if you wanna get some additional information, you can always um, contact a parent advisor at Peak, Center, Peak Parent Center as well. Um, the progress monitoring should be used to make instructional and service decisions based on student performance. We talked about in the development of the IEP, you really look at their present levels of um, academic and functional performance. So that's part of the progress monitoring, but it's also what's going on through the year as you, um, as you work through the IEP. And again, for the progress monitoring, reports, typically the school will have a data management system that sort of generates those reports from their input. So those will kind of have a familiar look and they it makes it easier for the school to tie them to the goals. Um, sometimes, um, for me anyway, sometimes that, you know, it might say progress made or insufficient progress made. So sometimes that, that use that progress monitoring report as a springboard for a conversation. If there's something you're seeing that you don't understand or something that you feel like isn't where it should be, you know, that's a, a reason to get in touch with either the person who is responsible for that area, or if it looks significant, maybe a team meeting. Um, and again, as we talked about in the content of the IEP, the IEP will have specific progress monitoring information, including the what, the who, the when, where, and how, meaning what are you gonna monitor, how are you gonna monitor, it, who's gonna be responsible, and how the data will be reported. And again, that's where, you know, be aware that that doesn't always have to be um, keeping track of certain things, you know, it can also be qualitative. Again, the, the um, progress monitoring should be tied to the IEP goals so that it can provide data to, insist, to, to assist in making decisions about the students, um, to guide in, instructional decisions, both throughout the year and at the IEP meeting and to provide the relevant data on student performance. Um, so we can see where the, the, the student is and we have the benchmarks at, at the beginning of the year, then data throughout the year. And then um, sort of at the end of the year when you have your next IEP meeting, you'll kind of see the progress through the year. Um, some benefits of um, progress monitoring, it, it helps um, the parents and students know what is expected. And also um, it gives you sort of a time when you can expect your information to be given. Um, it gives the teachers an organized record of students' performance, particularly in, in the context of having a system that helps them organize that. Um, it helps the teachers know what's working and not working based on the data. Um, it should be in an easy to understand way to show parents the progress. Often you'll see graphs or tables, which can help to make that data more accessible. And it gives the IEP team compre comprehensive data to inform decision-making. It also can give you objective information that helps to um, have conversations rather than just going on impressions. So next we're gonna talk about managing conflict and issues do arise in the IEP process. Um, part of it is just part of the process. The, the, the law was, was drafted, the design to bring in different views and perspectives. And whenever you bring in different views and perspectives, you won't always have agreement. Um, 
and and the idea is that by working through that those those different views and perspectives, you will get to a better solution. Um, so part of it is just part of the process, um, and also um, there are a lot of perspective, different needs, um, there are constraints on everyone in the process, and and I think the process can be really difficult for everyone. It can be overwhelming and difficult to navigate for parents. It's also a lot to navigate for teachers. There's, as you can tell with all this data of progress monitoring, there's a lot of documentation, a lot of reporting, in addition to providing all the instruction and sports and services. So there are a lot of demands on everyone in this process. So that can sometimes result in um, sort of fatigue and shortened tempers and things. So we encourage parents to collaborate with their team, but there are options for resolving conflict. Those are specifically provided in IDEA. So we'll go over some things you can do informally just on your own or before a conflict really develops to try and resolve conflict if it occurs. And then we'll go over the three options provided under IDEA. You can also get additional information on the dispute resolution processes at the Colorado Department of Education website. They have a, um, a table comparing the different options. So if it comes to that and you wanna get a better understanding, that's a good resource. So first we'll talk about informal resolution. Um, when possible, informal resolution is less costly than formal resolution matters in terms of um, time, energy, as well as dollars. Um, so, it's always helps to try and whoops, sorry that um, um, it always helps to try to resolve disagreements early before um, sometimes disagreements can take on a life of their own. And then your sort of conflict is really about the conflict and not about um, meeting the child's needs. Um, so if, if you if you do have concerns, speak up. Um, I know for me, when my background before I got involved with this, my I was sort of I always thought that you shouldn't speak up, you know, let it work out, let it work out. And so sometimes I would just wait till the, the problem was bigger and then it's harder to solve. So um, the extent that we can resolve conflict early, the better for everyone. Um, some things you can do if something's bothering you, um, you can have a conference with your teacher, the relevant teacher or service provider. Um, you can talk to the principal. Um, Sometimes if you're not sure who to talk to, you can also talk to the special education administrators. Um, in, the, in the bigger districts, there's different people in different roles, but it's hard to know who the right person is for you sometimes. So um, CDE also has on its website, a list of the special education administrators for all the districts in Colorado. And so um, they can't just be a resource to give you some information of like, hey, who do I talk to about this? Um, if, if necessary, you can call an IEP meeting um, of your team. When you are doing this, some, some other tips, um, it's usually begin by meeting informally with the lowest level person involved in the pro problem. You know, if, if there's a person that's a problem that it, it's best to try and work that out with them. You don't want people to feel like you're going over their head or um, sort of reporting them for something. But again, this is all very nuanced. So it will depend on your situation. Um, and what the issue may be. Um, so, but just be aware of um, the situation and who, who you think it's best to talk to, or at least to start with. Um, be polite, but direct. Explain the problem as concretely as possible and ask for help in solving it. And sometimes it can be really helpful before you contact the person at the school to have a conversation with someone else, whether a trusted friend, you could call Peak Parent Center, um, really think about what is it about this problem that that is the underlying issue? What's the goal? Where am I trying to get to? Sometimes we talk about that as interest-based negotiation or interest-based um, interest-based thinking. As we can get we can get stuck on a specific thing. Like I need to have this done this way. It won't work unless it's done this way. But if you think about why do I want to go this way? What's my end goal? There are usually multiple paths to reach that goal. And so um, be open to um, other paths um, and to have the discussion. So it's helpful to kind of know what is my goal and what's really important to me for my child and my child's future before you go in. And so practicing to talk about it or writing down 
before you have the conversation can help. Some other things um, that you can do are, um, there, there's a website, website called Cadre. It's the Center for Appropriate Dispute Resolution in um, special education. And it has a lot of resources there about conflict and um, defining interests and things. So that can be really helpful. Um, ask for data or other objective materials that are relevant to be the problem being addressed. And that relates back to the data collection. Um, you know, if you haven't been given data, you can ask for get data. So you can really see like, well, where is my child? What progress has been made? Um, sometimes we can get a feeling about something, but the data may, might show a different situation. So make sure you get a complete picture of the situation before you get too upset. Um, and then one other option is um, facilitated IEP or facilitated special education meetings. The Colorado Department of Education also has an alternative dispute resolution project. And the goal of that is to re resolve conflicts earlier. That involves having a facilitator um, come to your meeting and really support the process and the conversation so that um, people can better communicate and worked toward developing an IEP that works for everyone. So um, that also is available on the Colorado Department of Education website under CDE ADR. And we also have webinars on that topic um, that are archived on our website and then we'll have some coming up in the spring. So if you're interested in learning more about that, please check our website. Um, remember to keep the focus on what the child needs to make progress and keep the focus as much as possible on objective information. We know this process can be emotional. And so emotion can really interfere with conversations. And, um, and sometimes we just get upset about something that isn't the real problem. I, I see that a lot in my personal life sometimes, or even like, um, you know, my kids will be really upset about something that you know that's not what the real problem is. So try and kind of observe and communicate and really get to the heart of the problem. So again, IDEA provides three avenues of dispute resolution. Um, the first is mediation. So if your IEP process isn't working and you've tried informal options and you maybe, maybe you've tried facilitation, but it's still not working, um, one avenue is mediation. This is a free, confidential, and voluntary process where you sit down with the school and an impartial third party to work out a solution. Um, the, the, the mediator is impartial. The mediator doesn't represent your party and doesn't have an interest in the result. They, they just are there to listen to it and help you re reach an agreement. Um, it's at no cost and they'll find a timely and convenient location that works for everyone. If the, the, the group reaches a resolution, there will be a legally binding written agreement. Um, if, the, if, the, if there's no resolution reached, you'll basically be an impasse and you'll have to look at other dispute resolution options. But um, the result of mediation is a written contract versus facilitation in facilitation, you'll work toward a completed IEP. The next dispute resolution option is a state complaint. I like to think about this as a sort of more of an investigative process where they're looking into the situation and they'll make a determination. It involves filing a formal written complaint to the Colorado Department of Education. And they have on their website, the form that you use, they just recently updated it. Um, when you file the complaint, it will initiate an investigation by state personnel. Um, investigate the, the um, state complaint process can be best for procedural and implementation problems. Um, and the state can order compensatory services, teacher training and changes to policies. I believe the state complaint must be filed within one year. Um, and there's, there's no appeal from the state complaint process, but um, you do still have the option of due process. And then the this third option under IDEA is due process. Um, due process is more of a, like a, more of a legal proceeding, an adjudicative process where a hearing officer or a judge makes a decision. So that's more like the courtroom type situation. 
The administrative hearing will be conducted by the state administrative court. Um, it's a formal trial-like process with witnesses and documentary exhibits. This can be best for resolving significant differences of opinion about whether the child is getting a, a free and appropriate publication, public education in the least restrictive environment. So you're really looking at if there's been an IDEA um, substantive violation. The judge can order compensatory services, reimbursement for future services, but not money damages. Um, um, prior to probably prior to filing a due process complaint, it's it's probably a good idea to consult with an attorney or an advocate experienced in special education law and due process hearings to um, to talk with them about your situation and get a better idea of the process. Um, in Colorado, there is an agency called Disability Law Colorado who may be able to assist you or refer you to resources if you're in that situation. They're the um, state's designated protection and advocacy agency. Um, if you file a due process complaint, you will first need to have a, what they, a resolution meeting. Um, I think that uh, it, it must, it takes place within 15 days of the properly filed complaint. And that's where you actually meet and still try and resolve that. So there's always like this, you know, we're gonna do everything we can to try and resolve this before we have to go further on. Um, parents have two years from the date of the unacceptable IEP or um, whatever the, the, the basis for the complaint is to file the petition. And if you file a due process peti petition, as a parent, you have the burden of proof to prove that the school did not offer your child a free appropriate publication, public education in the least restrictive environment. Again, the, um, the, the determination and due process hearing may be appealed. Uh, we've seen that in the case we talked about in the first webinar with the Andrew F case. Um, they did appeal all the way to the Supreme Court. That took, I, I don't remember the exact time, but I think it was at least seven years, maybe longer. So this, if, if you end up going sort of the process, it can really make a difference in the bigger picture. But um, while that's all going on is why your child's still developing. So um, it, it definitely can be a time and expense. Oh, also, one other thing, there's, there's another process that's not um, under IDA that is also out there is, a, is the Office of Civil Rights. So um, that may be if there's a, a, a discrimination claim or something. So you can get more information on that from the Office of Civil Rights. And next, um, we wanna talk about why advocacy and family involvement is important. And uh, this is really like, this is sort of a passion of mine. I think a lot of people that come to work at Peak Parent Center really have a passion around this because it really makes such a difference in, in the students' lives. Um, this is a quote from someone named Corey Moore, who was, um, who I, I think that she wrote this in the 90s, but was sort of involved in the, um, in the late 80s, 90s in the development of um, thinking about inclusion and special education and things. And this quote says, we need to participate, not merely be involved. It is after all the child who knew, I mean, I'm sorry, the parent who knew the child first and who knows the child best. Our relationship with our sons and daughters is personal and spans a lifetime. So that really, I mean, that highlights so many important things on why the parent role is so important. And, you know, first is like that parent-child relationship is so important. And um, there's there's so much research out there on how having a, a strong parent relationship can really impact outcomes for all children. Um, also that, that idea of spanning a lifetime, your IEP team is made up of people in specific roles, but the people on the team will change over time. And it's sort of, more focused on the, the goals at school from year to year. So we know that now more than ever, there's so much learning that can help take place after school. I mean, outside of school and outside of the classroom. And so, you know, that's something that the parent can really be aware of and manage is having those community experiences. And the other thing is the, the parents really, the person who's the keeper of the long-term vision for the child. And, um, there are more and more opportunities and programs being developed to really open up the opportunities for um, 
for people with disabilities to be more involved in the community and to have options for post-secondary education and employment. Um, so there's really no limit in terms of what's out there. And so think, think big and kind of keep those big visions in mind. So some reasons why is family engagement important? Um, children do better in school and it helps schools get better. Children stay longer in school, um, which is very important. Students are more motivated to do well. Um, families can gain an understanding of how schools work. Um, families support schools and hold them accountable. And children and youth's lives change for the better. Um, again, you know, this is a system that has a lot of constraints and is pretty strained. And so the more we can be involved and understand it and try and work together, we can um, connect for change. So some goals of advocacy, um, we want to build productive, positive relationships with others, especially your IEP team. Um, and remember that it, it works best when everybody's collaborating together and working to provide the best supports possible um, and working to have the child um, achieve their best possible life. Um, it increases the flow of two-way information um, to participate at all levels of decision-making, to ensure student needs are met, and to build community partnerships. And those community partnerships we're seeing more and more are so important, um, both in terms of experience for the child and for working together to um, try and create more opportunities for our children and to create a better future for our children. Um, and, and, and just remember also that when you're working with your IEP team, they're working in their, their specific roles. And so we all have constraints on what we can do and the, the people working in their roles have constraints on what they can do because of their roles. So um, just look for ways that we can support each other and work together. Um, some key points to remember for from the, the webinar series. First, remember to know IDA and how the IEP process works. That background knowledge can really help you to um, identify when something doesn't seem right. Or even if you're, you know, maybe it just kind of raises a yellow flag or a question. Um, and you don't have to necessarily have the answer, but you kind of think, hmm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask someone about that because that doesn't seem right. Um, know what goals you have for your child. Sometimes for me, those IEP goals can feel sort of, you know, like my child will write a seven word sentence, you know, increase the number of, of, of words. Sometimes that can feel um, not that meaningful sometimes or, um, so just keep in mind your goals, both your long-term big picture, the why, what you hope they'll achieve, um, is keep that kind of as your guiding principle as well as what's really important. Sometimes um, a family may have a goal that's, that may not be what people typically have. You know, sometimes people value social goals. Sometimes people value um, inclusion goals, which we hope that everyone um, will learn more about. Um, but so kind of know what goals are important to you that may not be addressed by the team unless you bring it up. Write measurable goals. You, you want measurable goals so you can see what's happened happening and whether progress is being made. Stay in communication with the school, let them know what's going on, let them know what your concerns are. And if you find something that's not working well for your child, let them know. Um, you know, you might say, um, sometimes I think that you can get really busy and not realize that something's a challenge. And so you might say, oh, my child's having trouble with this particular thing and we find it helps to do this. Or um, it's always helpful to be curious and trying to find more information. So, you know, you're saying we're having struggles with this. What have you seen work in the past? What do you recommend? Um, and that's use effective communication and advocacy strategies. That's a big part of the facilitated IEP program, facilitated special education meeting program and the ADR project at CDE is really, um, giving a lot of trainings on skills for communication, such as um, open-ended questions, um, active listening and things like that, that can really help. So if you're interested in that, um, please check out one of those webinars. Um, if something isn't working, speak up. Don't sit there and stew over it. Um, I mean, it, we all have bad days 
um, sometimes you have bad months, sometimes you have bad years, but um, so, but, but if you feel like you have concerns about something, ask questions, get more information and get support when you need it. That, that can mean so many things we're, we're learning right now. There's so much talk about how everybody needs to uh, make sure they're taking care of themselves. And this is a hard process for everyone. And sometimes you just need to take a break. Um, also get the support you need to get more information. There are a lot of resources out there to get information on um, things that can help and ways to get to the through the IEP process. So um, there, there are some great organizations that provide resources. You can, as, as I've mentioned before, you can always contact Peak Parent Center um, to ask a question and they, if they don't have the answer, they can also direct you to different resources that might be able to help. So just keep in mind, you're not alone. There's a lot of people who have gone through this process. There's a lot of people who have struggled with this process. It can be a long, hard road, um, whatever situation you're in. So look for opportunities to support others and ask for help when you need it. These are some additional resources, resources specific to the IDEA as well as COVID. Um, OSEP is the Office of Special Education Programs, and you can get a lot of information about IDEA and the regulations. The Center for Parent Information and Resources is the Parent Center, um, the Federal Parent Center, um, I, I call it hub, but that's sort of the, the resource center and the place that provides resources for parent centers, and they have a lot of resources for parents. They have a newsletter that you can just sign up with your email, which is a great way to sort of keep up with changes. The law, um, sometimes the law is slow to change, but there's a lot of things that you might hear about um, and we may see some new changes. The, um, if, as we said, the IDEA was last reauthorized in 2004. People have been waiting for a long time for the new authorization. Maybe that will happen in the coming administration. We don't know, but the Center for Parent Information and Resources can Keep, give you updated information of things that are happening. Um, COVID-19 has really added a layer for everyone and created a lot of new challenges, but also we're seeing a lot of resilience being built, for, built from this too. Um, you can get some great resources on COVID-19 from the CDE website. Um, and again, I think, that, I think that list, link at the bottom is that list of the special education directors. Um, and again, they, they can be a resource to use to ask if you need in, more information. Um, so it doesn't need to be someone that you're calling because you have an issue. It may just be, I need to know who to talk to about this or um, can you give me information of this? So get the information you need. And with that, I will pass it back to Pam. Thank you. So thank you, Anne. And as soon as we are able to add captions to this webinar recording, we will post it to our website under archive webinars. And if you've been on the last two webinars, we are offering a random drawing for a rights law book. This one is called um, Special Education Law. I don't have my um, iPad with me right now, so it's on my phone. I um, put you all in mini web tool that's participating and I'm going to click pick a random name. So you can see that. And the winner is oh, oh, it's a little slow. Sorry about that. My iPad's a lot quicker. Tina. Tina, you are the winner. So if you could um, let me know your um, address, that I would greatly appreciate that. Um, and I, just- I'm sorry, did you say Tina or Tona? Tona, sorry, sorry. <laughs> my phone, I can't read it very well even with my readers. Tona, thank you, you are the winner, yay. If you could email me your uh, confirm your address just via email and I'll send you a reminder. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so to request a certificate of completion, please email me at pchristy at peakparent.org. Um, and thank you to our wonderful presenter, Anne, and to everyone that attended. Just a reminder, we do have, uh, Peak does have quite a few different resources. We offer webinars like this. 
We do have parent advisors in Spanish and English. Right now during COVID, they are taking calls Monday through Friday, um, 8.30 to 3. We have regional parent connectors across the state. Um, we offer workshops across the state. Right now, those, of course, are all on Zoom, similar to webinars. We offer a speak out blog. You can uh, read those on our website. And we are doing an annual conference on inclusive education. It's virtual this year. Um, hope that you join us. It's actually February 18th, yeah, February 18th through 20th. I did update that. So it's um, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Just so you know, we have professional youth and parent scholarships are still available. So if you're interested, please look at our, check out our website for additional information, or you can email scholarships at peakparent.org and they can send you the form you need to fill out. Um, the agenda will be available on Monday. I do know that it's um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 9.15 to 3.15 is the conference. And then the same days from 3.45 to 5.30, there are gonna be some social activities. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please contact any parent advisor at www.peakparent.org, 719-531-9400, or parentadvisor at peakparent.org. On behalf of Peak Parent Center and today's presenter, thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.